through the darkness. So one of the first things that's pretty interesting about owls is they have something called binocular vision. And this is true for humans as well. So binocular vision is when your eyes are situated on the front of your head. And this allows for really great depth perception as well as being able to tell size and speed of an approaching object. So as I said, humans have this and so do most large of binocular vision would be something called monocular vision. And this is usually true for prey species. So here I have our friendly Canada goose and you'll see that his eyes are located on the sides of his head, meaning that he does have monocular vision. So the advantage to that is that he has a larger field of view, but the disadvantage is that his eyes kind of are operating that he does not have his great of depth We can look up, down, side to side, we can roll our eyes, but owls cannot do that. So to overcome the fact that they cannot roll their eyeballs, they rotate their heads. So owls can rotate their heads an impressive 270 degrees. As you can see in this video right back here, it almost looks like they could turn their head in a full circle, which is absolutely crazy. And the reason that they can do that is because they actually have 14 neck vertebrae, which is about seven more than your average bird would have. So the next thing about our owl are rod cells and their cone cells. So I'm sure you're like, what is a rod cell? What's a cone cell? Well, those are photoreceptors that are in eyes of owls. So rod cells are going to be the cells that are sensitive to light and detail, while your cone cells are going to be the ones that are more sensitive to color. dark room, it's really hard to distinguish between different colors. Everything just kind of looks like varying shades of black and white. That's because those cone cells, the ones that register color, are no longer working. So because owls are primarily out at nighttime, they do not need as many of these cone cells. So they have less cone cells than a human does, meaning that they actually see in black and white. But they supplement that with having so they see an image that's brighter and more detailed than humans would which helps them navigate through the forest at nighttime their image is actually about two and a half times brighter than a humans would be um, and one thing that's really cool about the human eye our photoreceptors are aligned so your cone cells are in the center of your eye Humans actually have a blind spot. Look directly at something, that object actually disappears. But if you look to the right or to the left of that object, all of a sudden it comes back into focus. And that's because you shift from using cells, which do not work at nighttime, to using those rod cells, which are great for a low light situation. So that's something that's really cool. And if you ever with this you can actually play a game it's called the head game so what you do is you go out with a partner go out at nighttime let your night vision adjust which takes about 30 to 45 minutes that your head actually starts to disappear left all of a sudden their head comes back into focus so kind of spooky kind of fun game so another really cool thing about owls is and I'm sure that you're familiar with this. If you've ever had eyeshine. So eyeshine is basically like a thin reflective membrane that enunciates the light that is 
being funneled into the eye. So that light hits that reflective membrane and it funnels back into the retina and amplifies that image. So that's true for most nocturnal creatures, but humans of course are not nocturnal. So we do not have, uh, or what's it called, eye shine. We instead have what is called red eye. So I'm sure you've noticed this before if you've ever taken a photo with flash at nighttime and your eyes are spooky glowing red. What you're actually seeing is the blue your retinas. So because we don't have that extra reflective membrane, that eye shine, you're instead seeing the blood in our retinas, which is absolutely crazy. They have something called a dictating membrane, which goes diagonally across their eye, and that extra eye. located on the sides of their head hidden behind something that's quite interesting about their ear placement is that their ears are actually crooked so one ear is a little bit higher and one ear is a little bit lower meaning that this ear hears sound from above this one hears sound from below and it allows them to directly pinpoint where that sound is coming from that coupled with the fact that owl spaces kind of function like satellite dishes so you can see here on our barred owl, and especially on our friendly barn here, that their face is very flat, and it's surrounded by fringed feathers, and that's better seen in this picture right here on the TV. to flight, it's great to realize that owls have gigantic wings and their wings are extremely soft. If you were here right now, I'd let you pet this wing and you would feel how truly soft it is in comparison to something like a turkey wing. They may look similar, but also an owl has a way lower body weight than something like a turkey, but its wing size is almost the same. So these really large wings allow them to have powerful flight where they can carry off prey that may be actually heavier than they are, or possibly it helps them fly quietly. So this really, these really soft feathers are actually fringed along the edges, which allows sound, yes, Back in where we left off. So I was talking about owl wings and how important their wings are for their very special flight. So if you were here, you'd be able to tell that this owl is extremely soft. So in comparison to some fact that it is so soft and it is fringed along the edges like little tiny hooks as you can see right there on my screen allows for sound to be and air to be broken up as it flows over top of the wing so because of that owls actually fly completely silently so I have a video to show you guys that's basically going to show the difference between an owl in flight and some other birds. So we're going to see a pigeon, and then we have a falcon, and then a barn owl. Take note of how quiet that owl is when it flies. Good girl. Hi, 
silent when it flies, meaning that by the time it gets to its prey, they had no clue what hit them. So now that we know about all these really cool adaptations that make owls so stealthy, let's talk about what they eat and how they hunt. So owls are quite generalist. Depending on the species, they'll eat pretty much anything. So we have our smaller owl, like our screech owl right on the end right here. He likes to eat more smaller things like uh, insects or small rodents. But if you're talking great horned or our barred owl they will eat with it if it's too large to carry in their bill. And they have really cute little fluffy legs. I just absolutely love that. But they will take that prey, they'll pounce it. It's pretty much dead on impact. They'll usually sever the spine with those really strong grips that those talons have. And then they will either carry it off to another location to eat it or eat it right where they caught it. An interesting thing is that they will eat their prey whole. So if they catch something, they just gobble down that entire thing, meaning that they are eating the bones, the fur, and the feathers, yet they cannot digest those things. So what an owl has to do is an owl pellet, which is basically like owl puke. So before it goes out hunting for the night, it has to regurgitate one of these, and it is literally just a ball of fur, feathers, and bones. So if you've been lucky enough to do this in your uh, science class to dissect one of these, it's lots of fun. You can already see before I dig into it that there's actually a bone right on the outside, which is really cool. So I'm going to put this on this plate right here and see what our owl has been eating. So just based on this size, I would say that this is probably a great horned owl pellet. So I have already found the lower jawbone of a mouse, it looks like. So we know there's at least one little mouse that was unfortunate to be made a meal of. What else do we have in here? It's always fun to try to find like skulls. And if you're adventurous enough, you can even reconstruct the entire skeleton, like a little mini museum exhibit <laughs> for an owl's food. So here is a mouse skull that I have just found. Mouses are one of the owl's favorite treats. eating healthy. If there's tons of bones in there, I picked these things apart and found like three or four mice in them, then you know that your owl is eating healthy. But if there's barely anything in here, you know that maybe your owl needs something to supplement its diet. So now that you guys know how seriously cool owls are, I am here to encourage you to please invite them to your home. So one of the ways that you can do this is by building an owl box because owls actually do not build their own nests like other birds. So they will rely on abandoned nests of things like hawks or crows, but they really, really like tree cavities. But one of the is that tree cavities are most often occurring in dead trees. And we as humans do not value dead trees as much as live ones. That coupled with the fact that there is mass deforestation going on at unprecedented scales has led to a large destruction in the habitat for owls. So, and it's important that we keep our owl population healthy because they are known as a keystone species. keep in check the populations of everything below them, especially those pest species like mice. So if we start to see a destruction in our owl population numbers, we start to see a really large increase in the populations of the species that they usually feed on. 
So it's really great to encourage these things to visit your home, to build boxes for them. Even better, if you have a dead tree on your property that is okay to leave up, I highly encourage you to leave that tree up. You won't just get owls, you'll get really cool carpenter ants and woodpeckers making use of that dead tree, which is just as important as your live one. So if you do want to build an owl box, I recommend that you just look up the PA we have plants for all different types of owls, depending on what you want to invite to your yard. But just know that about 15 to 20 feet up on a tree, scatter it with about like two to three inches of leaf litter. Because like I said, those owls do not make nests. So they need something soft to lay their eggs on top of. And then also just ensure that you don't face the opening west because that's where our weather comes from. So you don't want like rain and snow to be pelting them while they are uh, just trying to raise their babies in there. But I always say that owls are like your free pesticides and rodent killers. So if you're someone that finds that you have insect problems and you're constantly using pesticides or you have a large rodent problem, maybe moles, I have using pesticides and instead encourage you to invite these guys to your home. They'll do it for free and they're definitely much prettier than a pesticide. So now let's move on to the owls that we have here in Pennsylvania. We're lucky to have eight different species here. So we have our great horned owl, our barred owl, our eastern screech, our northern sawwet, which I'm sure you guys remember from the Rockefeller Christmas tree story this year, the long-eared owl and the short-eared owl, your barn owl and your snowy owl, which is our winter migrant here from uh, the Arctic. So if you are to go out owling this time of year, around North Park, these are the three owls that you're most likely to see. So you're most likely to see here, our screech owl, which is this guy in this box over here, and our barred owl, which is this guy. So let's talk about that great horned owl. So, and he's actually the largest owl that we have here in Pennsylvania. And he is known as the most powerful bird in North America because he has been known to displace and even kill bald eagles. And when their claws are gripped around something, it takes a force 28 times to eagle. And they nest so early because they're large birds, so they have really long gestation periods. And um, they want to make sure that those babies are ready to go by spring when food is abundant so that they can learn how to hunt. But these guys, for being as large as they are, they're incredibly adaptable. They are our most common here in Pennsylvania. So you'll find them in pretty much any type of habitat you can imagine. And they really love forests with large old trees that, of course, would have lots of cats in them. And these are those guys that will eat practically anything. So they'll eat anything from mice, but also maybe amphibians. And one of their favorite snacks is the striped skunk. So when I say that, people are like, oh my God, why would you want to eat a skunk? Skunks smell awful. They probably taste awful. I just cut out completely. Oh, I saw that. I have an issue there. Are we good? Okay. Sorry, guys. So the reason that you are most likely to see this owl, besides the fact that it is the most abundant one in So this is the call of the great horned owl. So that's kind of the owl call that you're used to hearing. It gets added into movies when there's a nighttime scene and all that fun stuff. So next is our eastern screech owl. He's this little guy right over here. He is the Pennsylvania, and also the second most common. The smallest owl in Pennsylvania is the northern sawwet, which I do not have here. I have this little tiny stuffed animal. But because this guy is so small, he primarily eats insects and maybe small rodents like mice. But also because he really prefers to eat insects, 
this guy is the one most affected by pesticide use. So again, don't use pesticides. Screech owls to your home. And um, they are also starting courtship right now. So in February, they're going to fly out and start establishing their territories and finding mates. And then by April and May, they'll have about four to five eggs on the Really cute call. I like to say they sound like a winning horse. So this is your Eastern Screech Owl. Pretty cool. And lastly is the barn owl, which happens to be my favorite because they are very curious owls and they have a really cool call. So they are going to be, they're interesting because they're not as much of a generalist as your, um, your great horned and your screech owl when it comes to habitat. They really prefer woodlands that have swamps or wetlands nearby. And their diet is things that will And this is the time of year. Interesting because they are considered nocturnal, yet you'll often see these guys out throughout the day. I actually did see one when I was in West Virginia over the summer. They had, it was just sitting on a power line in the middle of the day. So it was pretty interesting. You never really know where you're going to see these guys. But like I said, they have a really, really cool call. It kind of sounds like they're saying, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? So I will play the sound of the barred owl and see if you can hear those words. <coughs> so that's pretty cool. They're lots of fun to play with. All right, you guys, so now you know all about the really cool adaptations that make owls so special. You know about the owls that you see here in this area in Pennsylvania. You know that you should encourage them to visit your home. But now I want to talk to you about owling. So, Owling is the process of going out for a hike at nighttime and looking and calling for owls. This is one of my favorite things to who's in their territory or maybe they think that you're a possible mate so if you call and one flies in they want to see why this guy is invading their space or if they call back to you they maybe think that you are a potential mate so this is why it's really important that if you do go owling you're not calling non-stop you don't want to go out there and just call straight for hours because that can stress the owls it will take them away from doing the really important things that they need to be doing and it's also important to remember to stick to one species of owls when you're calling. An unfortunate situation where a naturalist went out and took people on a hike and he was calling for screech owls. And it was great fun. and their hearing is so they're going to be sensitive to you being out there so you want to go out there and be really dark try to turn off all lights if you feel like you need light you can use like a red light setting on a flashlight or maybe cover your flashlight with red cellophane but honestly the human vision is pretty well after about 30 That's all I have for you today. I want to thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have you build an owl box or you invite owls back or flying. Please let me know. I'd love to hear it. But thanks again, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.